verse 1. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the end. We sing. Chapter 2, verse 8. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. And so they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in a manger. We sing. Chapter 2, verse 1. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened. And all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. And then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. 
On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. We sing. Well, can you believe that here we are on Christmas Eve? Have you settled down a little bit? Has the momentum slowed? Even going through these readings and songs, it's been a hectic pace out there, hasn't it? Maybe not for you, but you've seen it happening. It's all around. People are shopping and running ragged. You go by Walmart and the parking lot is just crowded. And it can get a little threadbare out there. We can get a little tired. And it's a time for traveling, and tired traveling is no fun either. And maybe some of you have traveled to be here in Sebastian tonight. I heard of one traveler went to the airport, and he was tired, and the clerk at the counter was obviously beleaguered. And he put his suitcase up on the baggage scale, and he looked up, and there was some mistletoe hanging up there. And he said to the clerk, what's this about? He said, it's Christmas. It's time to kiss your bag goodbye. <laughs> no. like, uh, well, it, at least they're honest about it, you know? So, uh, but here we are, the, the night that uh, we've been waiting. I invite you just to, again, soak in the music and the lights, the scripture, that you're sitting. Just take a deep breath and be thankful that you are alive and that you're with each other and that we are in God's presence. Let's pray. You are a good God and you have visited us full of grace and truth. And from your fullness have we all received grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, several years ago, there was a movie that starred the actor Russell Crowe. He played in it a betrayed general. And this general had a true emperor who was also treacherously betrayed. That general was not only fallen, but Maximus, the general, his family was cut down. They thought he was dead, but he had really gone into hiding and was a gladiator with a mask on. And that was the name of the movie, Gladiator. And there comes a point in which he is facing the archvillain, his nemesis, and it's just the two of them. And the one knows not the other, and this conversation takes place. The betrayer, his name is Commodus, and he says, Your fame, gladiator, is well deserved. Why don't you reveal yourself and tell us your real name? The general, his name is Maximus, is silent. So Commodus continues, You do have a name, Maximus. My name is Gladiator. And he turns and walks away. Commodus, how dare you show your back to me, slave? 
You will remove your helmet and tell me your name. Maximus slowly, very slowly, lifts his helmet and turns to face his enemy. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the north, general of the Felix legions, loyal servant to the true emperor Marcus Aurelius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. Whoa. Now don't, don't fix on that bit about vengeance, but listen to that cascade of names and titles. They rivet our attention. They burst off of his lips. There's a crescendo that weaves together in this elegant and raw power, leaving us with a scene in the movie that is compelling and stirring and memorable. I want to tell you tonight that there's a place in the Bible, somewhat obscured, but there nonetheless, where such a magisterial upswell of names comes forth. And it has to do with a champion for the people. The people are described as being in darkness and gloom, a metaphor for a general bondage for which they are utterly hopeless unless there is a rescue from the outside. But then, this champion is named in a prophecy and he emerges and says, I am the one from the ancient royal line of the great David. I am the one who has all authority placed on my shoulders. I am known as the wondrous counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. And of my kingdom there will be no end, absolutely no end. But before this impressive roll call of names in this obscure part of the Bible, there is a little word, just a little word, the word son. For unto us a son is given. For unto us a son is given. You see, somehow the God of heaven and earth took his heart, wrapped it in human flesh, put it inside a virgin's womb in the shape of a son. He took his heart, wrapped it in human flesh, put it in a virgin's womb in the shape of a son. You know, sometimes when we talk about uh, our visiting with other people, we'll say, well, thanks for sharing your heart with me. And what do we mean by that? We mean something like, well, you've been candid with me. You've shown me some of your true thoughts and feelings. You've uh, revealed yourself, and I appreciate your authenticity. Another time, a, a man will say to a woman, or a woman will say to a man, I give you my heart. And it's a little bit more than you, you've revealed some thoughts and feelings. You're saying, I entrust my person to you. I commit myself to you. On this night, 2,000 years ago, it all started with a son where God shared his heart, where God gave his heart, he enfleshed his heart, put it in a virgin's womb in the shape of a son. I'm not sure we realize how massively complex this is, how startling the ingenuity to pull this off. Back in 1961, Yuri Gagarin, Russian cosmonaut, had been into outer space. He was uh, steeped in the atheism of the former USSR. And when he returned from space, he gloated with these words, my atheism has been confirmed. I looked and looked, but I didn't see God. C.S. Lewis, a professor at Oxford University at the very same time, redressed Gagarin's remarks in an essay called The All-Seeing Eye. And in it he said that Gagarin's uh, approach was misguided and illogical. For you see, 
God wouldn't relate to us human beings the way somebody living in the second floor of an apartment building would come down and visit with people on the first floor of an apartment building. It just wouldn't be that way. If you want an analogy for the way it would be, it would be like Shakespeare trying to relate to Hamlet. You see the complexity and the ingenuity that must be involved for Shakespeare to relate to Hamlet? After all, Hamlet's whole story, his figure, everything, his thought is created by this one. How is he to know a Shakespeare who has created everything that he is and thinks? What Shakespeare would have to do is write into the story information about Shakespeare. And you know, that's exactly what the Bible says has happened for us. That if we look around at the natural order and apply a little bit of reasoning, we will deduce the God that we sense is there. And if we look inside at the moral order and apply a little reasoning, we will deduce the God we sense is there. But God isn't just giving us information. He's wrapped his heart in human flesh in the shape of a son. And a heart is different than an algorithm or a book. It doesn't say for God so loved the world that he gave us a book or a formula. He gave us his son. He gave us his heart. And when you give somebody your heart, that's of an entirely different order. It's not something you can delegate and say to your secretary, would you please take care of this? It's something you have to do yourself. So how does God take his heart and bring it as Shakespeare to a Hamlet? How does he bring it to us? Another person at Oxford was a lady by the name of Dorothy Sayers. Uh, Dorothy was actually one of the very first women to ever graduate from Oxford. Uh, She was a plain lady. Uh, She was a writer. Uh, She actually wrote detective novels very famous for a series called the Lord Peter Whimsey Detective Novels. Uh, Lord Peter Whimsey was an aristocrat, and he was uh, an okay kind of guy. He needed some help. He, He was lonely in some ways, but he would solve the problems. He would do his sleuthing. And somewhere along in the series, though, entered a character by the name of Harriet Vane. Harriet Vane. And Harriet started helping Peter with his cases. And uh, they became friends. And they eventually fell in love. And they got married. And they helped each other through the rest of all the series of novels. Did I mention that Harriet Vane, when she entered into the story, that she was a rather plain lady? That she was one of the first ladies to ever graduate from Oxford? that she wrote mystery novels. You see, what so many think has happened is that uh, Dorothy Sayers looked at the character she created, Lord Peter, and saw his need and, and loved him. And then she wrote herself into the story so that she could love him. Friends, this night, 2,000 years ago, we say it all started with a son where God took his heart and wrapped it in human flesh, put it in a virgin's womb in the shape of a son. He brought his heart into our lives. And it's a wonderful thing to think, well, Dorothy Sayers wrote herself into the story. But so many have observed this. John Ronald Reuel Tolkien of the Lord of the Rings series, uh, Professor Reynold Price at Duke University, they all comment that the very best of our stories, the very best of human stories, point, point, point to the real story. It all started 2,000 years ago on a night like this when he gave us a son. His heart wrapped in human flesh, put in a womb in the shape of a son. And when he did that, he did something singular. You see, history is littered with men who would be gods, but there is only one who is an infinite God who would be a man. Jesus the Christ, the heart of God. And religions have all kinds of gods. Some are impersonal, 
and some are personal, but all of them, impersonal or personal, are above and beyond. But only in this one, Jesus Christ, do we find one who has come into our experience. He's within and among. And religion after a religion will advise, go and do this and go and do this and you'll see God. But in the Christian faith, we find Jesus announcing this news. I am Emmanuel, God with us. And I know what it's like to walk in your shoes and live in your home and be in your world. You know, there, there is a big difference between advice and news. You know that, don't you? See, advice is you should do this, and news is this is what's been done. Advice is you should implement this, and news is this is what's happened. Advice is you should try and do this, and news is this is what's occurred. Vastly different. You see, if, if an army was coming against a city in ancient Greece uh, to invade it, the military advisors would say to everybody, build up the ramparts, put the trenches here, the archers there. This is what you have to do. But if your king intercepted that marauding army and defeated it, now you have news about what has occurred, what has happened. There is no longer an advisor who comes and tells you what you have to do. You live on the basis of an event and a news that has happened. The one who would bring that news was called an angelos. It's the word we have for angel. A messenger. And this night, 2,000 years ago, it all began with a son where angels came and said, I bring you great tidings of good advice. No, <laughs> he came and said, I bring you great tidings of good news. The true story has happened. The champion has come. God has taken his heart, wrapped it in human flesh, put it in a womb in the shape of a son and says to you and to me, for God so loved the world, he gave us his son. And that is good news. Amen. Live on the basis of the great tidings of great joy. This good news, we pray. Lord, we thank you that uh, this is not a matter of us trying to do X, Y, and Z, but this is a matter of us realizing your coming. And in your coming, you lived, and you taught, you healed, but you also died and you rose again. And so for all of these things, we give you our thanks and praise and ask that you would lift us into your service this night and forever. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. And now we worship.